By the power of shower hair, I say, video time. What's going on, guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. I'm showering every, like, two hours now because it's 90 million degrees in Kansas City. Jason's gonna comment and be like, oh, oh, Tommy, I hope you're okay. It's like 100,000 degrees in Texas. Jason doesn't talk like this at all. Whatever. We're rambling. Today, we're taking a monster from Bestiary 3 for the Forgotten Race review at the request of Wild-Eyed Changeling Ellie Nielsen, a woman of many names. We're going to break down the Geertabilu. Geertabilu. The, the Scorpion people in Bestiary 3. We're doing those. Yeah. Like, subscribe, ding the bell if you're liking what you're seeing. Today, this episode of the Forgotten Race review is brought to you in part by the woman who requested it, Miss Ellie Nielsen. Thanks for your help, dude. Here we go. So, I'm sure I've super botched the pronunciation of this race. Oh well. I'm just gonna call them Scorpion Folk moving forward. The Scorpion Folk are featured in several Akkadian language myths, up to and including the Epic of Gilgamesh. They are described to have the head, torso, and arms of a man and the body of a scorpion. According to legend, they were first created by Tiamat in order to wage war against the younger gods for the betrayal of Apsu. So that has fun connotations in Pathfinder. They stand guard outside the gates of the sun god Shimash at the mountains of Mashu. It was said that their heads touched the sky, their terror was awesome, and their glance was death in Pathfinder. Gonna try it one more time. The Geertabi... Geertablilu... The Geertablilu... I hate this. The Geertablilu... There we go. Guard many of the oldest ruins in Galarian's desert. They maintain a tribal culture of family groups who live near the ruins that they guard. Many chieftains are clerics of forgotten gods, oracles of mysterious ancient practices, or shamans empowered by the spirits of the past. Scorpion folk have a reputation for cultish zealotry and dedication to archaic faiths because religion, specifically ancient religion, plays such a major role in their culture. They believe that they protect the mortal realms from the terrible spaces beyond by performing rituals of long-forgotten creeds and preventing intruders from defiling the sacred places. And there you have it once again, giant ancient Egyptian monsters protecting us from Cthulhu things, neato. In the Inner Sea region, these guys can be found all across northern Garund and Kadira, so the Golden Road in Tui, basically. Adventuring expeditions in the desert usually encounter the scorpion folk in hunting or raiding parties, usually consisting of two to four of the actual scorpion folk and at least one trained giant scorpion. If the search for food takes these guys super far from home, they might not consider an expedition a threat, but if explorers roam too close to the tribe's territory, the hunters attack in order to prevent said expedition from stumbling upon the ruins under the tribe's protection. And now I will sit and complain about how the Inner Sea Monster Codex does not have nearly as many details about these guys as like the true Monster Codex does, so we gotta brew a bunch of it. So by and large, it looks like whether or not the male or the female scorpion is bigger depends on the species of scorpion. Since the Inner Sea Monster Codex doesn't give us any sort of like matriarchal or patriarchal society, I'll assume they land about the same. They're monstrous humanoids, I'll say they come of age around the same time as a human, 15 years old. Males and females both range in height anywhere from 11 to 13 feet splayed out from head to tip of stinger, both of which weigh anywhere between 7 and 800 pounds. The maximum age for these guys is 80 plus 2d 20 years. Now let's brew up that character sheet, shall we? Okay, so just like the centaur, just like the gargoyle, there's going to be a lot of dumb stuff here. Are these guys suitable for campaigns? I think so, yeah. Are they suitable for a 15 point by AP? Probably not. Take with a grain of salt. In any case, these are large creatures, we'll factor that into our ability score adjustment, and our ability scores are pretty impressive. Our lowest stat is a 10. Dang, that's nuts. I'll say, the Scorpion Folk has a plus 4 to Strength, plus 2 to Dex, plus 2 to Wisdom, and plus 4 to Constitution after racial abilities and penalties. They are large, monstrous humanoids with a base speed of a whopping 50 feet, a reach of 10 feet, dark vision out to 60 feet, tremor sense out to 30 feet, a plus 8 natural armor bonus, two claws that deal 1d6 points of damage plus grab, a sting that deals 1d6 points of damage and poisons you, the constrict special ability on their claws, and a con-based injury poison with a frequency of once around for six rounds that does 1d4 
points of dexterity damage, the cure is two consecutive saves. The scorpion folk also have scorpion empathy, which functions as a druid's wild empathy, but it only works on scorpions. Scorpion folk gain a racial bonus on this equal to their hit dice, and scorpions are normally mindless, but this communication imparts just enough intelligence that the scorpion folk can train scorpions and use them as guardians. Or I guess also be happy with the fact that they can summon nature's ally 5 for 1d3 giant scorpions once a day. They also have the undersized weapons trait, though they may be large, weapons they wield, and remember they've got two hands on top of those two claws are one size category smaller, and they have a plus four racial bonus on climb checks, perception checks, and stealth checks. So yeah, are we all ready to let our players play these yet? I think they're super cool. I suppose I'm not surprised that these guys are protecting the world from Cthulhu devastation. Now, I'm a pretty big fan when you have players who have to come in and out of letting them play something like this without class levels. They're only gonna be here for a day. Maybe the party runs into a scorpion folk who needs their help fighting off some aberrations or something. Who knows? The Inner Sea Monster Codex also has plenty of these guys leveled up, or at least like with class levels on top of their enormous character sheets. So all min-maxing notions aside, that's how I think these can be best used. At the end of the session they leave, when the player can make it, they come back. If you're still within the CR, you play that. If people have leveled up, then tack a Barbarian level onto this really quickly. The math comes out about the same. Now, playing one of these is an entirely different story, because they're really, really, really good. Having two hands free plus two pincer things means you can wield a greatsword, then also have two attacks. Specking into grab looks really good. You could play a poisoner on this. Super easy, because, I mean, you produce the venom. Just apply it to an arrow or something, and off you go. Hitting dex is a great way to hit the optimized character. God forbid they didn't up their dexterity. Again, this certainly won't fit with a lot of adventuring parties, but giving the non-monstrous players in the game a little bit of stat buffs, maybe a template, maybe slightly better gear, certainly helps balance things out. Anyway, what do you guys have to say about these? By chance have we played one? Have we fought one? How do you feel about the scorpion folk in your setting? Throw it in the comments, let me know all about it. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Patron sniping is real, but we'll be at the Nephilim next week. See you then.